All right, so welcome. Thank you all for coming. Um, we're gonna have a session today where we hear about the LTER network. And we have a group of scientists from across the network here that are from a lot of different sites. So uh, my name is Liz Schultheis and I'm from the Kellogg Biological Station, um, LTER in Michigan. We have Sarah Hobby from both the Cedar Creek and the Minneapolis St. Paul areas in Minnesota. Uh, we have Marty Downs, who's from the LTR Network Office, um, Alan Berkowitz, who's from the Baltimore Ecosystem Study in Maryland, and Clarice Hart and Savannah Brown, who are from Har the Harvard Forest LTR. So we have a lot of uh, expertise from across the network here for you. If you have any questions, definitely feel free to put them in the Q&A or the chat. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what is ahead for this session. So first, we're going to have a little introduction. We want to get to know you all and see who's here on the call with us. Um, then we're going to hear about the LTER network, then a little information about staying connected with the LTER, um, some opportunities for you to present your research, and then at the end, we'll have some time for questions. And again, feel free to put questions in the chat or uh, throughout, and we'll try to get to them as well. All right, so there's a few ways to participate. Um, because this is a webinar, you're all muted right now. So the ways to participate are by putting stuff in the chat and using the Q&A button to ask questions. Um, feel free to talk with each other as well as with the people who are presenting. And then we're also going to have polls and chances for feedback scattered throughout the presentation. So if you have a cell phone with you, uh, have it out because there's a lot of those um, QR codes that you can use to get the links or you can just type in the links themselves. Okay, so our first poll is to figure out who's participating in today's session, and then also to hear a little bit about your goals and what you'd like to learn from the session. So we have a QR code here where you can access the survey. So our first question is just, what are the research sites that you're associated with? And potentially have you done research or been uh, visited any additional LTR sites? So go check out that poll and I'm gonna keep an eye on the results so we can just get a sense of, um, which sites are represented in the call today. So there's already one vote for Kellogg Biological Station because I filled it out in advance. And then Clarice did Harvard Forest in advance too. So we're, we're winning, the, winning the survey so far. Oh, all right, good. There's uh, two from Andrews Forest, the Arctic LTR. Beaufort Lagoon Ecosystem LTR, Bonanza Creek, Let's see. the uh, Central Arizona LTR is represented. There's a lot from Harvard Forest, a few from Hubbard Brook, Jordana Basin, more from Kellogg Biological Station. Woo. We have the Northeast Shelf, Plum Island, Santa Barbara, Savieta, and Virginia Coast so far. Okay, so I think that's the list. So we've got a really good representation across the network. And then you're also able to see the results of the poll yourself. So you can keep clicking and refreshing if you wanna see the list of everybody who's here. Okay, so our next question, you can put your answers in the chat and just share that in your opinion, how long, how many years do you think a research project needs to be to be considered long-term? So what do you consider long-term research? I'm seeing anywhere from like five to 10, 10 plus, 10 years. Do you think that answer maybe is different depending on the ecosystem you're thinking about? Um, if you wanna say what ecosystem you're thinking of when you're thinking of your timeline, you can put that in as well. But I'm seeing a lot of, there's a lot of consensus around 10 years, 30 years if you're studying a forest, I, I like that. Okay, and someone's saying no set time limit. It's basically what you're studying and probably what system you're in. That's a great answer. Over 10 years, yeah. So um, we're gonna hear more about the value of the LTR network, but uh, basically there's a lot of uh, funding for research and a lot of research takes uh, time on shorter timescales. Research projects are often like three to five years in length. So you can see that there's uh, 
a lot of studies tend to be shorter than these uh, time spans that you guys are all discussing. Great, thank you, everybody. Okay, and then our last question before our speaker is um, just say one thing you'd most like to learn about the LTR network, and we'll try to get to this. Hopefully you all, can everyone hear the stomping above me? Apologies for a toddler running around. I'll mute myself as quickly as possible. That's my two-year-old stomping above us. Okay, so anything you'd most like to learn about the network? Oh, great, how to get involved. We'll definitely talk about that. How to get connected with others in the network. That's great. How to take, uh, how to participate in multiple LTR sites. Awesome. Well, great. All right, I'm going to start introducing Sarah, but keep these in the chat because uh, Sarah will be talking about the network, and hopefully, a lot of these are in her talk, and she can address these as she's uh, as she's going. All right, so um, it's my pleasure now to introduce our speaker for today, um, Sarah Hobby. So Sarah is a professor at the University of Minnesota, and she's also a fellow in the National Academy of Sciences. Um, she's the perfect person to come talk to you about the LTR network because she's done research at multiple sites. She served on the executive board. Um, she's done research in our Arctic site, Cedar Creek site in Minnesota, and now she's also the lead scientist of our newest LTER site that's located in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul in Minnesota as well. Um, so Sarah, I was trying to capture Sarah's research in one short introduction, but there are so many topics that her lab and her, uh, she covers. So just to give you a taste of what she does, um, her research focuses on climate change um, and also looks at how things like warming and increased green, uh, carbon dioxide and other changes to our atmosphere affect ecosystems and interactions between organisms and other processes in ecosystems. Um, she also does as well, in addition to doing research in natural areas, she also does research in urban areas and explores the interactions between people and nature and has the goal of understanding how environmental changes can be, or how environmental outcomes can be improved to benefit both people and also protect biodiversity. All right, and so I know Sarah's gonna talk a little bit about her research and work across the network as well. So I'll just uh, use this uh, time to pass it off to Sarah, who's gonna talk to you about her work in the LTR network. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, I thought what I would do today is give you a a little bit of background about the LTER. So what was the impetus for the LTER? Um, what does what the network of sites look like? Um, what do we do at LTER sites? Um, so just a little bit of a flavor um, of what's, what happens at LTER sites. And I want to just make sure I'm mindful of the time. Um, so I thought I would just give you a little bit of history, my own history with LTER. So I actually started working at in the LTER um, when I was a graduate student. So uh, back in 1990, um, I started going up to Tulick Lake. So this is me when I was much younger than I am today. Um, and these are some experimental plots that I set up um, looking at the effects of species composition and warming on um, carbon and nutrient cycling in the Arctic tundra. And then uh, when I became a professor at the University of Minnesota, um, I continued to work in the Arctic um, for a bit, but I also started working at the Cedar Creek LTER site, which is very close to the Twin Cities. Um, and I've looked at a number of different um, questions or addressed a number of different questions at Cedar Creek, including a number of long-term questions about the factors that control how things decay. Um, but I've also been very involved in the experiment that I'm working in in this picture, which is the Biocon experiment. Those white pipes in the ground um, are a mechanism for delivering uh, carbon dioxide um, over a, a 10 meter radius or so plot. Um, so we look at interactions between different human caused global changes in this experiment, including CO2 and temperature and precipitation and nitrogen inputs and biodiversity. Um, and then I started working in urban systems 
systems um, a number of years ago and uh, including on street sweeping projects, which if you have time to talk to me, if you come to the all scientist meeting, I can actually give you the sort of intellectual linkage between the, what I showed you in the Arctic and street sweeping, but I don't really have time to make that connection today, um, except to say that I'm very interested in the role of trees as um, conduits for nutrient pollution from land to water in urban systems. Um, and I worked on some other projects as well. And um, sort of long story short, um, just about a year ago, we received funding to for a new urban LTER site in the Twin Cities. Um, here we are down in a floodplain forest uh, right in the city of St. Paul along the Mississippi River. Um, and this is um, literally like across the river. Well, it basically is, is located at um, the site where the Dakota people um, believe their people began. It's called Bedote. It's the coming together of the Minnesota and the Mississippi rivers. Um, and so we're doing some work looking at the effects of climate change on these floodplain forests. Um, so yeah, I've been around LTER for a long time in a lot of uh, sort of different roles. Um, and, and I feel very passionate about the importance of LTER um, for advancing um, ecology and social and ecological um, coupled research. So the LTER um, was established um, back in 1980 and their sites have come and gone as you'll see in a moment, but right now there are 28 sites in the network. And LTER was started because people recognize that it's really difficult to study ecological processes over the typical three-year grant cycle. That ecological processes play out over long time scales. And so we need mechanisms for, for, for funding that kind of research that, that can allow us to study those processes. And so unlike other most other NSF grants, LTERs are funded for six years. And at the end of six years, there's the opportunity to apply for renewal funding. And so as you'll see in a moment, many sites have been funded actually for multiple decades. And there are thousands of investigators um, in the LTER. They come both from um, academic institutions, but also from, from agencies. Um, so federal, state, local agencies, as well as um, nonprofits. Um, one of the hallmarks of the LTER is that there's been a real emphasis on making data publicly available. And so we have um, thousands of publicly available data sets that anyone can use um, to, to address new questions. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and we've published thousands of, of, of journal articles. And I wanted to give you just a little bit of a flavor of these sites. So you can see on this map that these sites are mostly in North America, although not all of them are in North America, but they encompass a range of ecosystems and biomes. So I just wanted to walk you through um, some of those. So we have a couple of sites um, in Antarctica. Um, so this shows one of them. And then at the opposite pole, we have um, a number, we have several sites now in boreal and Arctic ecosystems, um, including this one at Beaufort Lagoon. Uh, we have um, coastal sites, a number of different coastal sites, um, such as the Florida coastal um, site. So um, all this, the, the, the area that's sort of draining the Everglades. Um, and then we also have um, reef, a reef LTER, so the Maria Coral Reef. Um, we also have inland freshwater um, sites uh, within the LTER network. Uh, we have tropical forests. We have a number of temperate forest sites that vary quite a bit in the amount of precipitation that they get and the sort of their seasonality. Um, we have multiple grassland sites, um, including sites in tall grass prairie, um, but we also have um, sites in, in desert grasslands. And then there are several um, urban sites in the network, and we also have one agricultural site. Um, so quite a diversity of different kinds of ecosystems um, are represented in the LTER network. So just to give you a sense of, of what we're about, um, there's a big emphasis on long-term observation. 
questions, and I'll talk about that um, more in a bit. Um, but almost, I would say at all of the sites, we're, we're making observations of things and making collecting the same kinds of data um, over and over and over again. So we can then look at how things are changing in through time. But at the same time, many of our sites have complementary long-term experiments where we're manipulating some factor. Um, and again, I'll give you some examples of that in a moment. But this is a really powerful sort of combination because it allows us to compare our long-term observations with the results of our long-term experiments. So for instance, if we look at variation over time in response to changes in climate that are happening either because of human activities or just natural fluctuations in climate, we can compare the ecosystem responses to that, that sort of natural or ambient variability, um, whether it's natural or human caused um, in climate to our climate manipulations. Uh, we also have long-term relationships both with um, community partners and again, I'll talk more about that in a minute, as well as with, um, with educational partners. And then finally, um, we're really um, mindful about expanding opportunities um, and embracing diversity in our science. And um, the RU program is definitely an example of both these long-term relationships as well as expanding opportunities um, so that we can try to um, create scientists of the future that are more representative of our society. And so this is just a quote um, from a fairly recent paper about sort of what the LTER is all about um, and why it's important. Um, so long-term ecological and environmental studies allow us to better understand the inherent variability of natural systems and to, to discern trends and shifting baselines and to witness rare events and unanticipated ecological surprises. So looking at inherent variability of natural systems and witnessing rare events and surprises would not be possible in if we were only doing projects over short time scales like a, a regular three-year NSF grant. And so the value of the LTER is really being able to study these long-term processes that we just can't study in any other way. This just shows the timeline of when sites came online. And I apologize that, you know, these are all these three letter codes that probably you know the three letter code from your site, but not any of the other sites. But you can just kind of, you know, ignore that level of detail. But the colors are interesting to look at because they show the different types of systems represented by these different sites. And so there are a couple of things to take away from this. You know, one is that some of these sites have been in existence continuously funded for um, four decades or more. Um, so that's a really long time to be able to study processes. Um, the other thing that I'll point out is that we kind of started out more um, I guess on land or on the on the margins of the land, and then have added um, more marine sites over time. Um, and in addition, we've added more. These urban sites came online. Those are the black lines. And the other thing you'll notice is that um, there's like admin. So you know these gray bars represent different iterations of um, of administration at the site level. And so that is important because that funding is what allows us to basically function as a network and do work across sites. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So um, the LTER is, um, is our sites are, are commit to, to studying, doing research in um, core areas um, that are defined by NSF. And so um, there are these five sort of traditional, the original core areas of primary production, so annual plant growth, um, understanding the dynamics of populations and communities, understanding the patterns and control of organic matter accumulation, 
um, understanding the patterns and movements of inorganic nutrients um, from land to water and understanding um, the patterns and, and dynamics of disturbance events. There are a couple of core areas that were added a bit later, um, and these are core areas that the urban sites in particular um, are charged to address, but um, a lot of the other sites also um, focus on these core areas, and that is understanding the dynamics of coupled social and ecological systems, recognizing that humans are integral to many of our ecosystems, and then also understanding the, the causes and patterns and dynamics of, of changes in land use and land cover. So just to flesh some of this out, um, LTER science really is a, a key part of it is, is these long-term observations. Um, and so all LTER sites have core data or have core data sets that they're collecting. Um, and these core data sets often are, you know, what are focused on these core areas. So we might be collecting uh, long-term data on net primary productivity, for example, or long-term data on, um, on key species um, populations, or long-term data on uh, disturbance. Um, and the sites are definitely um, operate as individual sites. And so the questions that a particular site is addressing is really driven by understanding, you know, local understanding of, of that ecosystem and, and the factors that are important to that ecosystem and the responses that are most important to study. Um, and just some examples, here's a tundra fire um, in the Arctic. So when I was a graduate student, I remember asking my advisor if there were ever fires in the tundra and he said, nope, not really. And now we see tundra fires happening much more frequently because of climate change. Um, and so this is a, something that's changing. And so um, the LTER is an opportunity to both document that change and, and study its consequences. Um, similarly, um, here's some erosion happening at Plum Island. So this is in uh, the northeastern US. This is a coastal system, um, a salt marsh system. And again, this is a system that is changing because of sea level rise. And so LTER is an opportunity to study that. Um, this is a um, just an example of how we can, using LTER, we can fund the, these long-term observations of the dynamics of organisms. So here's an example from Santa Barbara Coastal, this kelp system. Um, and this is just an example of a pelagic um, shrimp from the California current ecosystem. So again, we, uh, through LTER, we have the opportunity to make repeated observations of um, the abundances of different organisms. So LTER is also all about experimentation. And so this long-term funding allows us to establish large scale long-term um, experiments. And so this is, uh, and I apologize in advance, these are gonna be a little bit biased towards Cedar Creek because that's where I work and have pictures from. Um, but this is one of the first experiments that was set up at Cedar Creek in 1982. It's a nutrient addition experiment. It is still going on to this day. Um, we are still publishing papers from this experiment and we're learning new things from this experiment. And comparing it to newer experiments and realizing that some of the assumptions that we made um, in our original papers are not necessarily um, supported. Um, this is an experiment from the Arctic. These, that, those lines are, are boardwalks for scale. There's a person standing on a boardwalk. So these are greenhouses, plastic greenhouses and plastic shade or and shade houses. And then there's some nutrient addition. You can see that swath of green and also some fences to exclude herbivores. And so this also is an experiment that was set up back in 1989 and it and is still ongoing and yielding insights. Um, this is a simulated ice storm at the Hubbard Brook LTER. So you can see that they're spraying water in order to simulate an ice storm in order to understand the dynamics of, um, of these extreme events. Uh, this is a 
a forest biodiversity experiment at Cedar Creek. These are seedlings and saplings that are just starting to establish in what will be uh, is a fairly new long-term experiment looking at the effects of uh, biodiversity on ecosystem function. This is a, a, an older biodiversity experiment that was set up in mid, the mid nineties um, in a grassland system um, was one of the original um, large scale biodiversity experiments set up to understand the effects of biodiversity on the stability of ecosystems as well as on ecosystem processes. This is an iconic um, experiment that was set up at Hubbard Brook um, where they conducted a deforestation experiment at the scale of an entire watershed and then looked at what happened to the export of water and of the things that were carried in water, things like nutrients um, and other solutes. Um, and then sort of continuing at Hubbard Brook, um, this is an experiment adding calcium um, in mineral form to an entire watershed to understand um, the consequences of soil acidification and the reversal of soil acidification um, uh, at the scale of, uh, because of atmospheric um, pollution um, at the scale of a watershed. So LTER science also includes modeling. Um, so uh, we use con both conceptual and math mathematical models to develop predictions. And one of the cool things about LTER is that then we have all of these long-term data as well as experimental results that we can, we can validate our models against or test our models against, compare our models to. And we can also test our models across sites. And do we see that you know, our models are good at capturing the site-to-site -site variation that we see? Um, LTER science includes engagement with stakeholders. So there's um, a long tradition of engaging with practitioners, tribes, policymakers, the media, and other folks in the public domain. Um, and so there's uh, an opportunity then for LTER science to shape policy decisions. And there are clear examples where LTER science has been informative to policy. And then the LTER network office provides um, workshops in science communication and resources for LTER um, investigators. And there's also a, an intersection with the arts. So the Ecological Reflections Network as an example connects artists and writers and humanists at LTER sites to explore and communicate site science through, um, through art. LTER science includes um, education. And so LTER science, uh, scientists are engaged in education programming across levels. Um, every LTER site has a schoolyard LTER program that is um, engaging in K-12 programming, um, but there's also engagement with national STEM education organizations. There's uh, something called the, the data nugget and the data jam um, programs where we basically use LTER research and data, long-term data to develop teaching resources um, around, um, around standards that, that teachers can use in their classrooms. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for teacher professional development um, and including a new cross-site research experience for teachers project. So, the NSF has been great about giving LTER sites supplementary funding so that they can host um, K-12 educators at their site. So those teachers can be kind of embedded in the research um, and then take that experience back to their classrooms. And then of course, scientists are engaged in mentoring and training across all levels of education. And the RU program is one great example of that. But we also of course are training graduate students and postdocs, and we often have high school students working um, on our projects, um, as well as undergraduates outside of the RU program. Um, and then I kind of wanted to end with just mentioning um, science synthesis, because um, I think you know, you're going to hear more about um, attending professional meetings, but especially the all scientists meeting, which is a great example of where science synthesis happens. And so, as I mentioned previously, because we make LTER data publicly available um, through the Environmental Data Initiative, as well as um, other 
platforms for disseminating data, then people around the world actually can come and, and, and use LTER data um, either sort of on its own or in conjunction with data from other networks um, and, and then ask questions that can't really be asked at a single site or find out whether what we see at one site generalizes to other sites. Um, and so the LTER network office supports these data synthesis activities through supporting um, workshops um, that either that happen kind of as standalone, but, but the all scientists meeting is one place where um, people are especially um, excited to gather and, and ask synthetic questions using LTER data. Um, and then the LTER network is engaging with other national and international networks to share data, context, experience, and perspectives. So you might have heard of other networks like NEON, for example, or CZO. Um, there's an international LTER um, program. And so these are all networks that we interface with um, and conduct synthesis across. And I think that is my last slide. So I'm going to turn it over to Marty, um, who's going to talk more about um, connecting. You're muted. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was an awesome tour around the LTER network. Really appreciate it. I'm Marty Downs. I run the network office for the Long Term Ecological Research Network. So we um, do all the things that help pull those sites, those 28 sites together into a, a bigger network. And if you can advance to the QR code, Clarice, or let people, or Sarah, thanks. Um, we'll let people check into that poll. Um, while you're doing that, I wanna, the, the question is to build on your summer research, what would you consider doing? And the options are things like, um, would you come back to another, to the same site as an REU, as a graduate student, as a um, research assistant? Are you interested in going to other sites or taking on a cross-site project? And I just wanted to say that one of the things that I particularly love about the LTER, uh, and like Sarah, I have worked at many LTER sites over my career. Uh, one of the things I particularly love is, is that ability to sort of reinvent yourself, to grow your science across different sites, across the network, and to take on different kinds of roles. So one of the, the things that someone said early on they were interested in knowing was, was like, what's a typical day like, or what's a job description? And um, hopefully you'll get some taste of that in, in this and in the next webinar in August, but uh, it, it's very difficult to say that in any one thing. Every day is different for most of us, and there are dozens of different job descriptions in the network. <laughs> Thanks, Erin. Uh, I think so too. And um, so let me just, I guess I have to, there we go. Check out the results. Mm. It looks like Aaron is not alone. Quite a lot of people checked many things, um, but definitely exploring other sites is a big one. Um, and uh, I hope you all get the chance to do that. Uh, Maybe you guys can add to the chat as we continue the, uh, the rest of the presentation, what sorts of resources you've found most useful to your research at an LTR site and a sort of corollary to that is, you know, what other resources do you think might help future students or would you have found useful? Um, and then we can, while you're doing that, uh, We'll move on to uh, the next slide, please. So REUs at LTER sites are um, 
we have a bunch of different, you guys probably know this pretty well, but uh, we have a bunch of different ways to be an REU at a site. There are uh, five or six, I think right now, formal LTER sites that have large groups of, of REUs and um, strong support for those programs. So professional development and regular meetings and all of that sort of thing. LTERs also have uh, supplemental funding for REUs, which means one or two people at a site uh, who may have terrific scientific relationships with their mentors, uh, but don't have the same level of support. And one of the things that we're trying to do with, uh, with this presentation and with the program more broadly is to connect those students across sites so that you get a chance to meet each other and figure out how to connect with other um, other undergraduate students and other researchers. Thanks, next slide. Uh, so how, how do you find out what's happening in the network? Uh, well, we have a network website that we work pretty hard at. Uh, it's got a lot of, a lot of stories from uh, both the network office staff and I think uh, Gabe De La Rosa, who's our uh, digital communications coordinator is on this call. Maybe you can, uh, yeah, hi Gabe. How's it going? Yeah, so we have a bunch of ways that we disseminate information all over the network. Um, the main sort of catch all for everything is our network website, which is right there at alternet.edu. It contains stuff like webinars like this are posted on there, but also a wide variety of stories, either written by me or we have a bunch of graduate students writing stories about research at all sorts of different sites. We have information on our all scientists meeting coming up in the fall, a um, bunch of information on what it, each individual site. And really, if you just want have a question about the LTER, um, you can probably find it there. Um, the second best way to get information on us is probably uh, via our Twitter account, which is at USLTER. That's where we send out really short, uh, quick updates on things that are happening soon. Um, so things like this webinar, we posted a bunch on that. Um, but then we also go around and highlight uh, current research, cool events, we retweet from all the sites. Um, and there's a whole lot of information that goes through that Twitter. Um, we also have an Instagram account, which is a fun way to sort of stay in tune with what's going on at, sort of at re uh, in research around the network. Um, that for the last couple of months has been taken over by graduate students at all our different sites. Um, and so they've been posting for, I think, two weeks since. They go through and post a bunch of pictures from Andrews Forest or Central Arizona Phoenix. And you get really a sense that we can't at the network office can't give you of what life is like at all these different sites. So that's really cool. And then our YouTube is a, is a huge variety of stuff as well. We have a bunch of recorded webinars. So if you see something and then you miss it, uh, but you can't attend it, you know, it'll probably go up on our YouTube. We collect uh, videos from all over the network. Uh, so stuff sites put out. We have a bunch of information, a bunch of presentations from sites and a whole variety of stuff. So definitely check out that too. Awesome. Thank you, Gabe. And then uh, for getting things pushed to your inbox, the LTR newsletter is probably the best source of information. So once a month, we put out a huge newsletter. Gabe works with um, seven uh, graduate student science writing fellows to put together stories. Uh, so those research stories come out in the newsletter. We have a DEI resource of the month and uh, a whole uh, array of upcoming activities that are often linked to stories on the website, as well as jobs and funding opportunities. So uh, those jobs and funding opportunities come out in the newsletter in a section at the bottom. But if you wanna make sure that you don't miss any of them at all, uh, there's an automated newsletter that comes out once a month with just the opportunities. Um, so that's a great way to hear about what's happening. Two ways to sign up for that. One is to just go to the website and at the bottom of the sidebar, there's a, um, a little blue box that links you to the newsletter. You can sign up directly there. Uh, but we'd also love you to go to ltrnet.edu slash LTER hub. Uh, you, many of you will have been directed there by your information manager or your mentor or your site PI. Uh, and sign up on the LTR hub for an account. That uh, 
will also let you connect across sites. It sort of creates an LTER identity and allows you to choose uh, different um, newsletters that you can uh, kind of add to your options. Next slide. So I'm gonna hand off now to Clarice Hart at Harvard Forest and Alan Berkowitz uh, at the Baltimore Ecosystem Study. So Alan's here. Hi folks, I'm not sure that Alan is here. Um, so I have been back channeling with Audrey Berker Plotkin, who is here at Harvard Forest and has been in the LTR network for a long time. Do you wanna introduce yourself, Audrey? Sure. Hi, everybody. Audrey Barker Plotkin, she, her. I'm um, a co investigator at the Harvard Forest LTR and work with a lot of the long term experiments that we run, as well as um, the PI of our REU site. So I'm really involved in undergraduate research at our LTR. Yeah. So I'm Clarice Hart. I'm the director of education and outreach at Harvard Forest, and I've mentored students for I think 12 years in our in our REU program. Um, and LTR is one of my favorite things about my job. Just love LTER. And one of the coolest things about LTER is the fact that we all get to meet each other. We get to visit other LTER sites. It's kind of once you're in the family, you're in the family, right? So you get to kind of go to other people's houses and, and talk to them and learn from them. So Audrey and I are gonna um, work together and then I'm gonna introduce Savannah Brown as well um, in a second, but we're going to talk to you about what do you do after your summer research? Um, where might you present your research? How might you make the most of all of these networks that exist? How do you get connected to them? Um, next slide, please. Thanks, Sarah. So um, there are a bunch of ways that you can present your research and um, almost, in fact, maybe all of them have funding opportunities so that it doesn't have to be on your own dime. Um, this is one of the most wonderful things about being a student or a recently graduated student. Um, I was a first-gen college student, definitely didn't have money for going to conferences. Reg registration can be pretty expensive, um, but the equal various societies know this, and so they try to make it easier on students and early career folks. So a meeting that many, many ecologists go to um, is the ESA Ecological Society of America meeting. That's in the left-hand side there. Um, this year, it's in Montreal, Canada, so it's also with the Canadian Society for Ecology and Evolution. And um, next year, it's going to be in Portland, Oregon. And abstracts, if you wanted to present your research, you would have already had to put in an abstract for this year. Um, but there, you could put in an abstract for next year. And for next year, there are registration grants available. Um, and if you wanted to go in person, you can also volunteer in person for 10 hours, kind of helping to run sessions, kind of running AV, things like that. And then you get free registration. Um, so lots of ways to, to support get to a conference. And Audrey, why do, why do you want to present at a conference? Oh, so many reasons. So it's a way to practice communicating your, you know, your science communication. It's a way to let people know the amazing research that you're doing and to find people who are interested in the same topic that you might collaborate with. And especially as an undergraduate, you know, you might be considering a job or graduate school, and it's an excellent way to meet potential um, advisors or, you know, or job opportunities. Yeah, and there are usually um, different events that are specifically for students and early career folks. So they really help you to navigate not only the meeting, the meeting, but also the networking process. And um, so I'm not going to read through, I know you guys can read, and you can download these slides if you'd like to, um, but this is just information on more um, conferences that many LTER researchers and educators like myself um, go to. So why don't we go to the next slide. Um, NSF Bio REU travel grants. This used to be kind of a little known pot of money, but I think we're trying to get the word out a little more that these travel awards of $1,000 are available to you guys, um, you folks, to present your results at a scientific conference of your choice. So all those conferences that were on the previous slide, like those are those are game for, for this kind of funding. You do need a letter from your mentor and you need to have some lead time to do it. Um, but Audrey, is there anything that you want to add? Add about that particular yeah, just activity. just a couple of specific things because I've been communicating with the people who administer the these travel grants recently. I know that they're kind of in the process of getting a renewal for the funding. So any uh, conferences that you might be interested in going to this fall or later, 
that funding isn't lined up yet, but it sounds like it should be. Um, so if you, you know, take a note of that link to, to the travel award information, and that should be updated soon. Um, I think by that, like early September and, um, also the travel award might be a little more in the next, in the next round. So that's good news too, because travel is expensive. Yeah. Great. Next slide. Another opportunity that, um, kind of COVID interrupted it. It used to happen annually and it was in person in Alexandria last year. It was virtual. It's sort of unclear what's going to happen this year, but um, another fully paid way to um, go and present your research. And you you do it by getting nominated by your mentor, which is typically due in August. But since they don't have anything about it on their website, stay tuned, I guess. Um, Audrey, I don't know if you know more about that. Being I don't know any more details about what the plans are for this year, but I, you know, but I will you know, give a plug for this conference. I went um, as the kind of the advisor with a student in 2019, and it was a great opportunity. I, I like made there, you know, because it's near National Science Foundation, you get to, there are program officers who come to the conference. And, you know, I ask the mentor that you're taking, that's taking you with them, if you could set up a visit, like I set up a visit to the National Science Foundation, we had lunch with our program officer, it was awesome. Um, so it's a, it's a cool way to get to know a little bit more about the kind of funding side and kind of national level research priorities. Yeah. All right, next slide. So there are lots of different organizations and societies that are set up um, to enhance networking. So one of the great ones is ESA Seeds. That's within ecology, um, and that's for building diversity in, in ecology. And um, they have a leadership fellow program that's very cool. That's throughout the whole year um, if you go to fellowship. And they have local chapters at many different universities. You can put it in the chat if you're involved in your local Seeds chapter. Similarly, SOC and ACES. Um, both are variously kind of diversity focused, really about empowerment and um, just building students up with representation of other mentors that are like Latina, like, like me, or um, Indigenous. Like they're, it's so important to have mentors, right, who, who are like you. Um, so SACNIS is a fantastic organization. Their fall conference is in uh, San Juan this year. And ACES, I forget where it is this year, but you can click on the link. Um, it's in October and I'm just spacing. Oh, it's in California. It's in Palm Springs or somewhere in California. Um, so take a look at these. They all have travel awards. They all have, you know, ways to get there um, for free if you need that. And, and they all have kind of regional and local chapters. So ways to get involved, even if you're not traveling to a, to a local, I mean, traveling to a national conference. Okay. Next slide. Okay, so we are also here to just totally like hawk the all scientists meeting because it is such a cool meeting and we have this travel opportunity for students who are still students but who did um, a an RU experience either last year or this year. Um, so we have an application which maybe Marty or Gabe can put in the chat. Um, to be one of the 20 students who is able to go have their expenses fully paid to attend the meeting. You don't um, have to present a working group, but we do support you to present a poster. Um, so it's just a really great kind of smallish conference, very hands-on, very kind of non-hierarchical in the working groups, the way that they happen. Like it's not just somebody talking for 15 minutes and you kind of ask questions at the end. It's like everybody gets together in these groups of like 20 people in a room to talk about one problem and you're there for an hour and a half together and you really are solving it together. So it's a fantastic conference and we're going to have um, some small group mentoring sessions for the, the 20 students who attend. Um, so we hope that we'll see an application from you and we're totally happy to answer questions about this meeting. Also, it's at in Monterey or near Monterey in Pacific Grove, California, and it's right on the water in this kind of all-inclusive resort, which I gotta tell you, like before I became an ecologist and an educator at an LTER site, I never went to anything like this. I didn't even know things like this existed. And once you kind of get into STEM, you get to go to these like amazing places like this. So that's the All Scientists meeting. Audrey, do you have anything to add about that? And I wanna introduce Savannah next. 
Yeah, I think mostly introduce Savannah, but I'll I'll just say that this is the all scientists meeting is by far my favorite meeting. Um, it just you get to connect with people in a really genuine way and you know and really think deeply about ecology and education and diversity in STEM. There's so many things um, that that there are working groups on and communications. So next, I want to introduce Savannah Brown, who is here on the call, and I'll just let you introduce yourself, Savannah, um, and what you're going to be doing at the All Scientists meeting. Oh, hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm Savannah. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm currently um, at the Harvard Forest REU, along with Clarice and Andre. Um, my 20 students, I was laughing because they were cheering in the background when Clarice said my name. Because <laughs> they're awesome and goofy. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to be uh, kind of working on a lot of the behind the scenes of coordinating the students that are at this meeting um, and then on site during the meeting to help coordinate students um, and wrangle people and get people where they need to be and do logistics and things. Um, so I'm super excited. Uh, I've heard wonderful things about this meeting. Um, and I was an RU student here in 2019. So it will be cool to um, get to see it from both, both perspectives now. Yeah, and thanks Clarice for introducing me. Yeah, thanks for being a part of it. Thanks for pulling the group together. It's just such a great thing. I wish we could, like Marty said, I wish we could bring all of you seriously. For um, sure. <laughs> please be sure to apply. When are the applications due, Gabe, Marty? July 24th. July 24th, it's coming up. You got 12 days, you can do it. It's not long, um, it's, it's not, not hard. Long. It's not hard. Yeah, everything that Marty said. Um, okay, last slide is just making the most of a conference. So there's one more quick poll. Have you been to a national conference? And the options are, yes, I've been just to attend. Yes, I've been to present and no. chat looks like <laughs> there's a lot of no 85 percent of people say no and some people about 15 percent of you have gone and presented so if you could just click the slide forward a little bit if if you have been, what advice do you have for others? And then if you could click it one more time, Sarah. So here's my advice and Audrey, so anybody on this call, feel free to chime in. So here are my things. I'm pretty introverted, weirdly, even though I'm like a science communication professional, but you have to introduce yourself to the person sitting next to you at every session. You have to do it because the coolest conversations happen. And then you want to, if the coolest thing that you go to make sure that you follow up with the speaker either right after their talk which could be a little overwhelming because there are lots of people usually kind of milling around or via email um make sure you visit the exhibit hall see the posters go get the free swag talk to the exhibitors ask what they have for students read the meeting bulletin board their jobs events visit the poster session you guys if you come to the all scientists meeting you'll be presenting posters um, and pace yourself. Meetings have a lot of things happening at the same time, and it can be a lot. Um, so talk to your mentor about how they approach conferences, because I guarantee they don't go to every single session. You got to like build in that walk, and you got to build in the coffee with that scientist that you've always wanted to talk to, or something like that. It's good to pace yourself. How do you download those slides? We'll put that in the chat. Does anybody have any other advice for conferences? before we pivot to questions? Give yourself permission to talk to somebody who's even lonelier than you are. Yes. <laughs> yes. It feels so good for both of you. And I've met some of the most interesting people that way. People want to hear what you have to say. That's absolutely true. Don't feel like, oh, I'm just a student. Like you're, no, everybody is interesting. Every, we're all in this field because we're so curious um, and interested. So oh, we're excited to talk to each other. Native seeds here in central Arizona. That's really cool. Everyone's a dork. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to put the link to the slides. Um, so anybody can download them if they'd like to. And 
Um, we have a few minutes left for questions. I'm happy to stay a little bit after, um, but if people have to go right at the end of the hour, that's totally fine. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, do you wanna actually, wait, Sarah, can you share that last slide just for a second? Thank you. Just one, yeah, click it one forward. Yeah, so there's the information about the travel fellowships for the All Scientists meeting. And then we're also gonna have another webinar on August 9th that's about communicating your science for diverse audiences. Those of you at Harvard Forest, you've already kind of seen this presentation, um, but we're gonna be focusing it more on like how to make a poster and how to do a talk. Um, so it'll, it'll be somewhat different. And do you guys have any questions for us? Marty, I don't know if they're allowed to unmute themselves or how that works. Uh, I can unmute people if uh, if you let me know that you want to be unmuted, or you can just put questions in the chat or in the uh, Q and A. Either way, and I I'm happy to stay around for a little while. Also, yeah, I want to have thank one shameless, too. shameless LTER network office self promotional item which is if you are a user out in the field this summer, which you are, we're running a photo contest and we'd love to see some undergraduate uh, photos get in there. Um, so we'll announce prizes at the ASM. Um, we'll have a whole bunch of them and we'll be sort of highlighting and selecting different photos as the photo contest unfolds. So stay tuned on our Twitter and on our Instagram, but it should be a really fun way to sort of see what other people are up to around the network. Um, and it should be really fun for you guys to sort of get involved in the broader network as a whole. Um, so definitely consider, you know, snapping, taking your best pics, um, either with your iPhone or off a camera and, uh, submitting to that, them to that photo contest. Yeah. I'm really excited to see what comes in there. At the last ASM, didn't you guys put the slideshow of the all the photo submissions during like kind of between sessions, between keynotes? That was very we cool. We did all of the art, art and science projects. Yeah. That was the uh, Mary Beth Lee put that together. But this time I expect it'll be photo contest. Awesome. Krista, were you in were you in Tulip or were you where were you? I'm so curious about the Alaska sites. I've never been. Whoa. Cool. Oh. You're at the LE. All right, maybe we should just close. Seems like, but we're here in case anybody yes. wants to email us, you can find us. Um, and you can also find us through your, whoever invited you to this. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so yep. thanks for and joining. All very approachable and open to getting questions. Thank you guys. Thank you. Bye to the Harvard Forest people. <laughs>